Welcome to the Membership Guys podcast. Kick-ass advice and tips for membership site owners. Hey guys, thank you for downloading the latest episode of the Membership Guys podcast. I'm your host, Mike Morrison, one half of the Membership Guys, and this is the show in which we discuss all things membership website related. And a huge Happy New Year to all of our listeners. This is, of course, the first show of 2016. So I hope all you guys had a great holiday and you're back and raring to go to make your membership goals happy happen within the new year and of course because this is the first show of 2016 i've got something very special lined up for you in this episode i'm talking to robbie kelman baxter the author of the best-selling book the membership economy now the membership economy is definitely one of my favorite and Callie's favorite books on the subject of membership-based businesses. Now, when it comes to discussing membership sites on the Membership Guys podcast, on our blog, within the Member Site Academy, we're largely talking about a certain type of membership site, primarily e-learning or community-based membership sites, where essentially what your members are doing is paying for access to you, to your content, and to your community. But of course, that only represents a certain element or a certain type of membership business. Robbie comes into the membership model with a broad range of experiences working with some huge names in the field of membership businesses. Companies like Netflix, where she's helped them to put their members and their customers right at the heart of what she calls the membership economy for their business. So I really enjoyed this conversation with Robbie. There's huge amounts of value that you can take out from our conversation, apply to your own membership site in terms of strategy, mindset, and approach. So without any further ado, we're going to jump right into my conversation with Robbie Kelman Baxter. All right, so I'm joined by Robbie Kelman Baxter, author of The Membership Economy, which is without doubt fast become the go to book on all things related to the membership model. Robbie is also founder of the consulting firm Peninsula Strategies and works with some big players in the membership space, including Netflix and SurveyMonkey. Robbie, thank you so much for joining us on the Membership Guys podcast. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Mike. It's great. It's such an honor to have you on. Both myself and Callie are huge fans of the book. And uh, yeah, we've read it several times. Lots of awesome stuff in there. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure our listeners as well, the membership economy comes up a lot uh, from our audience, from our members of our own site. So uh, I'm sure we'll get a lot of really good nuggets of uh, good stuff for our audience during the show. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm excited to be here. Really looking forward to it, Mike. Awesome. So for anybody who hasn't read the book or hasn't come across you, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and when it was you kind of first picked up on the big shift we've been seeing towards the membership economy? Sure. So I have been in Silicon Valley for almost my whole life since I was four years old. Um, so that's a lot of years. <laughs> and <laughs> I don't want to tell you how many. And, um, you know, for most of my adult career, I've been a strategy consultant. Um, I went to Stanford Business School here. Um, I was a con big firm consultant before that. Uh, five years in tech industry working with SaaS companies. So software as a service, which you know, as you know, runs on a subscription model yeah. and actually has a lot in common with, with membership organizations, um, although I didn't realize it at the time. Um, and then about 15 years ago, I started a consulting firm, Peninsula Strategies, um, didn't exactly know what it was going to focus on. I was, you know, I came out of big firm generalist strategy work. So mm. that's how I started. And then I worked with Netflix um, as, a, as an early client and I fell in love with their business model. Um, I loved three out at a, you know three movies out at a time. Yeah. I loved 
um, the way that they seem to be getting to know me through the data. So they would actually say, oh, Robbie, maybe you'd like this movie since you watched those movies. Um, that was the first time I'd seen a recommendation engine. Mm. Um, I thought it was amazing. I mean, they, I remember learning about it. They said, well, we have this complex algorithm that's been developed by a team, and it actually makes recommendations based on what other people who have similar profiles are watching. Like, and it was, I mean, now we, we live by, I mean, you, you can't go to a, an, an e-commerce site without a, without a recommendation engine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, but anyway, I fell in love with them as a, as a consumer and then as a, as a consultant, um, their, their subscription model, um, the fact that they were so good at retention, um, they were so focused on delivering on a mission and they were so willing to change their offering to stay relevant to their members. And I said, okay, this is what I want to do. I want to be an expert on, you know, basically what I called at the time, the Netflix model, you yeah. know, and I, so people would call me and say, Hey, we want to be the Netflix of news, or we want to be the Netflix of music, or we want to be the Netflix of software or the Netflix of dentistry or the Netflix of bicycles. I mean, you wouldn't believe what people <laughs> You know, <laughs> the ideas, the, the really crazy and wonderful ideas that people have. And so I, I've just been focused on that um, really since since the Netflix days. You know, now that's, you know, I, I know when I worked at Netflix because I have a 12-year-old son and I was pregnant with him when I um, – when I was deep in the throes of doing work with them. Okay. <laughs> so I can always I can always look at how tall he is and, and remember how and long it's back been. to Netflix, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think what you you mentioned there about Netflix particularly stands out the the um, willingness to change their business model because of course the Netflix of today bears pretty much no resemblance in terms of their deliverable, so what they actually deliver to people. To, you know, it doesn't really bear any resemblance to what it would have done when you start working with them. But of course, underlying all of that, a lot of the same principles are still present and have you know developed and evolved over time. Yeah, absolutely. So one of my deepest beliefs is that the best membership organizations um, are built around the mission and the member, yeah. as opposed to being about around the product. And so many organizations make the mistake of falling in love with their product. So yeah. they start, a lot of them start out mission driven. Like, you know, we're like in Netflix case, we're going to make it possible for people to have movies without having to go to Blockbuster and without having to deal with late fees and going to the movie store and not seeing a movie you like and wandering aimlessly through the aisles. You know, we're going to make it really easy and efficient for people to get great, um, great professionally created video content mm. without leaving their homes, right? That was their whole, and that's still what they do, right? Great video content, professionally, you know, professionally created video content without leaving your home. Except that now Netflix does it through streaming, through creating their own content. Um, whereas, you know, 15 years ago, it was DVDs um, and it was it used to be movies only and now it's movies and TV. So yeah. They've evolved, but they're they're staying relevant, and and part of that is due to changes in the um, in their competitive landscape. So they couldn't be competitive anymore if they just had movies and if they just had three out at a time. Yeah. Um, and part of it is due to what's possible, right? You know, th things that weren't possible 15 years ago, like streaming, wasn't a thing. You know, the the, the bandwidth wasn't reliable enough to stream um, to stream high. Um, high resolution, you know, video content. So, you know, and, and I think for your, for your listeners, um, you know, thinking about what is that reason that people join in the first place mm. and how, how are their needs changing and how can I, as an entrepreneur, create new offerings that meet their changing needs? Yeah, absolutely. And I think what we see a lot uh, within the element of the the membership space we operate in is that people get very distracted by the technology so trying to figure out which components do i need to pull together to uh, handle the delivery or handle payment or whatever so they get wrapped up in the mechanics of it yeah. uh, as well as also in the uh, the the payment model so there's obviously a very clear distinction and difference between subscription and membership and i think we certainly see a lot of people falling in love and getting addicted to the subscription element and what's in it for them and what the benefits of yeah. subscription is to their business without actually thinking of their members 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you bring up two, I think, well, many really important points, um, but, a, but a couple of them that, that, that really resonate for me. Um, one of them is this, this, question, this idea of the technology being more important or spending more time getting the technology right than getting the value right. Yeah. And, you know, I know from just, you know, that you're a little bit of a technology nerd and you're really <laughs> good at that stuff, um, which is awesome and creates a great experience for your members. But I would also guess that if it was just, you know, you and your partner um, writing stuff up on a typewriter and then <laughs> posting it, people would still come because the value's there, the content's there, mm. the, 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 what's going to help them to be successful. Um, and, you know, the technology is wonderful because it makes your life easier and it makes it easier for your members to access that value. Yeah. And in your case, some of the expertise that you're providing is actually advice around the technology. Um, but but the the idea is that even the simplest of you know delivery mechanisms can be fine if the content's there. And for a lot of organizations, when they're starting out, like don't get your knickers in a knot about the the technology. Just figure out how to get it into the hands of the people who are going to love it. And then if they love it, then you say, okay, now I'm going to spend a little bit of time and money figuring out how to make it more efficient and more elegant. The other point that you brought up, you know, which we don't have to have to talk about is this, what's in, you know, we're all really aware as entrepreneurs of what's in it for us, why yeah. subscription is so great. But the question of what's in it for them is, is really the, the guiding, that should be the guiding principle. Definitely. And more so, I think, with membership sites compared to, you know, traditional info products where people are selling maybe just a one-off course or an ebook or some sort of tutorial or video series where as soon as you've got the sale, you're, you're away. You know, you're, you're home and dry. You've got the money in the bank. Your job's done. That relationship is finished and it's on to the next person. I think the, with a membership, that sort of mindset of just focusing on yourself, you can't really get away with that for very long because the the relationship and the transaction starts with the sale rather than ending with the sale, which it would do in, in the transactional model as you refer to it in your book. Yeah, absolutely. The the in the you know, we talk about this a lot that in the membership economy, you want a forever transaction mm. um, where they're gonna stay with you for as long as they have that need. Um, and so the the transaction becomes the starting point, not the finish line. Definitely, definitely. And I think that's one thing that you see a lot of people who, uh, I mean, we're around the online marketing, the internet marketing space a lot. And probably the, the defining characteristic in being able to tell what mindset somebody has when they're putting out a membership product is you'll often see them refer to it as continuity rather than membership. Mm -hmm. And for me, that kind of frames it as where their priorities are lying in terms of why they're doing this. You know, continuity is something that is something for your business. It's continuous yeah. income, whereas membership, it's it's not about you. It's about your relationship uh, with your, your customers. Yeah, absolutely. So how have you seen the membership model? Obviously, there's a technological element, but... Uh, from a, a large, a larger picture point of view, how have you seen the membership model, the membership economy evolve in recent years? Well, you hit the nail on the head. You know, technology is really extending the, the infrastructure of trust. It's making it possible for us to develop trusting relationships with organizations, even if we don't know them um, kind of personally or in the real world. Like you and I are talking right now like old friends, but there's an ocean between us, right? Yeah. And a continent. I mean, we're really far, far apart, but um, you know, technology enables us to transcend time and space um, and makes it possible for all kinds of new relationships to develop. And yeah. that creates all kinds of possibilities for entrepreneurs to offer more value. So all kinds of stored value is kind of unleashed through this technology. Like you can bring your members together to talk to each other and to talk to you in real time without you know, using, uh, you know, uh, conference calls, right? Yeah, <laughs> Which yeah. was like, when I was growing up, that was like the cool thing, <laughs> you know? And before that, it was um, letters to the editor, right? right? <laughs> Same idea. But, you know, if you think about letters to the editor compared to your, um, your membership site, yeah. I mean, light years of difference. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, just case in point, 
as part of our membership site, we do two live monthly training sessions where obviously we're doing kind of uh, webinar real time stuff and we've got a little chat room to go alongside it. Now we've, we get our members in, we have a good interaction with them. There's probably two or three, I think, of our members actually live within uh, 30 minutes of where we are based and we communicate with them. We, we've never met them in real life. There's never been any sort of request for them to meet up with us because everyone's kind of huddled around this technological center of communication. Uh, and it's, it's an odd shift. And I think it's, I know this has been mentioned on a few podcast interviews you've been on in terms of how uh, society is changing in terms of how, uh, how much people don't really necessarily know who their next door neighbor is, but they have friends and clients uh, at the other end of of the country. They've got friends and clients on another continent and so on, but they couldn't tell you the names of two people who live on the same street as they do. Yeah, absolutely. So it's changing where your relationships are. And mm. it's not that I don't think it's, I do think it's important to know your neighbors for all kinds of practical reasons. It's amazing. Like, yeah, if, if your house is burning you know? down, yeah. <laughs> Right, your house is burning down. Um, somebody to hold your key. You yeah. know, if you lock yourself out. You know, I lost, recently locked myself out, and my neighbor drove me to my husband's office to pick up another key, and and that's lovely. Um, but for for things like um, areas of of, uh, of of interest and passion, um, causes you care about, and and professional development, you might find that your neighbors don't have that much in common with you, but somebody across an ocean. Uh, might be able to to help or to inspire um, you in your own um, objectives. So it's it's a wonderful thing to have that expansion. Absolutely, and I'd imagine actually that uh, you know if going back to the days where your community was just the people you live near. You know, I grew up in quite a quaint, typical English village. Everybody knew everybody. And if there was any sort of shady or unfamiliar looking characters around, <laughs> you know, the, the phone chain would start where, you know, people would be ringing each other. Have you seen that guy up at the top of the village? So to go oh, for, gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but I'd imagine <laughs> contrasting that to now, if you had a particular interest or a passion and nobody in your media community shared it, then that interest or that passion would quickly die out because you you don't have the connections with people necessary to fuel it whereas now anything you have an interest or a passion about you're just a few clicks away from other people yeah absolutely it's amazing and again just kind of on the the connection and and you know what technology does in terms of bringing people together Callie and myself uh, my other half we actually met through a membership organization uh, which was set up for uh, businesses for small businesses it was a business networking organization she actually lived at the other end of England I never really left uh, my area and yet we got to know each other through a membership community and you know now five or six years later I should really know whether it's five or six years shouldn't I uh, <laughs> <laughs> however long later uh you know we're we're together we're running the business together and that all stemmed from a membership community oh that's awesome you know um it's a funny story uh because you bring up the kind of the partnership um mm. you know the linkedin folks um that started linkedin before you know the the company that the professional you know biggest online professional community in the world yeah yeah um they were started the guys who started that before they started linkedin they had a company called socialnet which was a dating site. Right. And, and uh, the problem with a dating site that they found was that if they did a really great job at bringing people in and solving their problem, helping them achieve their mission, yeah. those people left in six months. <laughs> so they said, the next time we start a company, we're going to start it where if we do a good job at serving their needs, their needs are going to stay constant. Yeah, yeah. For a long time, like your career, 40 years, 50 years instead of six months. Yeah, it makes sense. Unless, of course, you know, you live in a particular part of uh, of the world where you can have multiple partners, multiple wives. Right. right. And, and that's what Tinder's for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. There, there, there's plenty of, of uh, you know, I just think I think that, uh, you know, Reed and, 
and and Alan and those guys are maybe a little more. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. High brow than that. I don't know. Maybe I think yeah. Not. I think we maybe steer away from the dynamics of uh, how the membership economy uh, <laughs> incorporates Tinder. Um, <laughs> that could be a whole other show. <laughs> yeah, it's providing a need that many people seem to have, right? Let's it see. is. It is definitely. <laughs> now, obviously, we we'll talk about Netflix and you know how they have adapted over time to their customers' needs. Now, one of the big things you talk about in in your book, and is certainly very, very prevalent, is this shift from ownership to access. So going from a point where it was very important that you owned the movies that you're watching, it's very important that even in terms of home ownership, home ownership, particularly in the UK, I don't know how it is in the US, home ownership versus uh, people who rent their homes, that balance has shifted car ownership is shifting more and more towards leasing so obviously when it comes to the membership economy that move in focus and move in prioritization from owning something through to just having access to it has obviously been a a big big part of why companies like netflix have been so successful yeah absolutely and and what is important for entrepreneurs to remember is that very rarely does somebody buy your product because they want to own your product? Yeah. In other words, I own a car because I need to get to certain places. I need to carry other things. You know, I have, I have, you know, other people, luggage, cargo that I have to bring with me. And I need the utmost of flexibility in terms of my timing. Yeah. Right. But I don't really need a car. Like there, if, if there were always a car sitting in front of my house that I could borrow whenever I needed it and I had confidence that it would be there, that would serve my needs. Yep. So being, you know, not getting stuck on your own product is, is really what we're, what we're talking about. And when we talk about the move from ownership to access, it's saying, okay, what is the real thing? You know, I have a subscription to this magazine. Is it because I want the magazine or is it because I want the content in there? Yeah. Absolutely. Or is it because I like to be associated with this brand? Maybe I just need the T-shirt. Maybe I don't even really, I don't even really read The Economist, but I just leave it on my counter because I want people to know that I'm really smart and you know caught up on world affairs. Yeah, yeah. Right? Give me the T-shirt, not the <laughs> magazine. <laughs> yeah, that kind of re- reminds me of the episode of uh, Friends, where I think you've got Joy who was decked out in all the uh, all the Porsche <laughs> gear with the Porsche cap right, and right, all of right. that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the same sort of thing, exactly. and it's. It's funny, though, when you talk about people uh, particularly relevant to uh, the sort of sites that our audience in particular would be building, people don't need to own that. And I know you uh, you had a conversation with James Schranko, who um, I'm a big fan of. I'm actually part of his membership site. We're, we're part of everybody's membership site just by nature of what we do. Uh, but uh, one of the big things that I found hilarious several months ago, he actually posted a photograph of all of these courses that he'd collected over the years. So all of these online courses where they send you seven or eight huge ring binders full of material, 10 DVDs and whatever. And it was just this big photo of this massive pile of all this course material that he was throwing out. Because after it consumed it, it just went in a, a cupboard somewhere or on a shelf somewhere and was never used again. So it, it's it, it's that bit of a fallacy in terms of people actually want to retain ownership of something once they've consumed it. Yeah, that's such a, I mean, it's such a great point. It's funny. I, I have one client who I'm not going to name hmm. where when I started working with them, they sent me a box of DVDs and magazines and all kinds of other, you know, stuff right yeah. and it's sitting here by my by, on the floor and I kind of want to get rid of it um, <laughs> because I don't need it and the whole point of the project that we're working on is to get everything online because their members need access to the information yeah they don't need all of that at once and once they've read through or experienced or done the video they may not need it again so you really want to focus on okay we need to provide them like you gave the example of you know people creating uh, membership communities right like James Schrenko, you don't need the introduction anymore yeah right you're you're at a different level so two things there's sort of two implications one of them is that you don't want to have that introductory video sitting on your shelf anymore cuz you're you're never going to be a beginner again and the the other thing is now you're probably you know within that community you're probably pushing the bounds of his expertise right you're 
you're the reason that he keeps researching and learning and doing new things because you're kind of frothing at the mouth for the next bit of content, mm. right? And, and in a great membership organization, you've got those super users, those leading edge people that are really pushing the bounds of the community that are driving things forward. And the, um, the, the organization itself, the, 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 the membership uh, community owner needs to be, I think, at least as focused on those people on the bleeding edge as mm. they are on the people coming in. Absolutely. And it's it's all about continuously adding value. Because like you say, yes. people will, you know, if you have a finite uh, set of resources available, then you're setting an endpoint for your usefulness, essentially. Right. Right. And and your cus- your members, I mean, the great thing about a membership model is that your members have an incentive to give you the feedback that's going to help you continue to keep them, right? So, you know, I would imagine that your members are saying to you, you know, Mike and Callie, hey, we, we, now we know how to build a website, but now we're wondering, you know, how do we use Periscope or what do we do with video or how should we think about this new trend that we're seeing that didn't exist last month, yeah. right? And so it pushes you forward because you need to stay relevant to them so that they don't have a reason to cancel. Um, and what that does is you keep, by keeping the experts in your community, that makes, that actually creates a magnetic pull for new people. Cause they look at who's in your, they're like, well, who else is in the club? And they're like, Ooh, all the people I admire are in the club and they're staying. So I'd love to be a part of that club. Absolutely. And, you know, I think for us, definitely our members are our our biggest source of ideas and inspiration. And again, one of the things from your book, having just reread it again last night, uh, where you mentioned Steve Jobs and mm-hmm. this notion that, you know, Steve Jobs' uh, standpoint of people don't know what they need. Uh, so I'm going to give them and tell mm-hmm. them what they need. To a degree, I think there are some examples over the years where that has has proven a good approach, but not everybody's Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs didn't get it right all of the time either. So, you know, actually conversing with your 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 members, with your audience, and getting them to feed back on what they need as their knowledge grows, as their progress through their journey through through uh, the material we've made available for them i think that's invaluable for anyone who has a an e-learning or an online community offering absolutely and the thing about steve jobs uh you know may his memory be a blessing mm. um who did so many wonderful things created so much great stuff he, what he did wasn't necessarily the pa- the likeliest path to success so it's yeah. sort of like saying Hey, I won the lottery. That's how I got rich. <laughs> so therefore, what, what you should do, you look at me and you say, well, Robbie won the lottery. So that's a good way to get rich. I'm yeah. going to play the lottery, right? <laughs> Just because that worked for me, the, you're much more likely to get rich if you, you know, you know, invest in, you know, in more conservative, you know, things or you invest in real estate or you, there's lots of other proven ways where most people who do these things get rich, right? Yeah. If you go to a good school and you become an investment banker, you're pretty likely to get rich, right? You know, that is yeah. the most straightforward path to making a lot of money that I've ever seen, right? Commodities trader, whatever. You can't copy Steve Jobs and say, I'm going to be a genius about guessing what people <laughs> want because you can't, you can't copy being a genius. Yeah. What you, can, what you can copy is say, but there's all these organizations that have been really successful by noticing what people need. And, you know, the thing with market research, you know, I'm a marketer, you know, and I, you know, I went to business school to, to do market research, market strategy. And one of the things I know is that you don't ask somebody what they want. You listen to them and look at them and see what the problems are. And then you figure out the best way to solve the problem. So for example, if I say, my problem is my horse and buggy are really slow and I have to feed the horse and it's a lot of effort and I need an easier way to get from here to there that doesn't involve taking care of an animal and, you know, the time issues, right? Hmm. Then you might come up with a car, right? But they're never going to tell you, I need a car. Yeah, they're going to yeah. say, I need a faster horse that eats less, <laughs> right? And you'd spend all your time breeding horses instead of thinking, what's a faster way to get people from here to there? in comfort with low maintenance. Love that. 
<laughs> so, so obviously we've talked about some of the the missteps or or perhaps the uh, misalignment of people's mindset when it comes to the membership model. What would you say are some of the more common mistakes that you see come up time and time again when businesses are first trying to transition from a more traditional transactional business model over to the membership model? Okay. Well, the first most obvious thing is they love their products. Yeah. So. Like I'll come in, let's, I'm working with a lot of um, magazine and news companies right now. And one of the things that's a very real thing that they need to think about is there's a, there's a declining number of people who want their information on paper. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And because the cost of, of sharing content has declined so much and the distribution channels have become so much more democratic – people are not going to be willing to spend the same amount for the New York Times online as they are for the New York Times in print, yeah. right? Or maybe the New York Times is a bad example because they're actually doing better than most. But a lot of, like the Christian Science Monitor went out of business. You know, lots of companies have really struggled with this. Mm. So one big problem is just saying, okay, my product might not be the best way to serve the mission of my members anymore. It might be, and, and in a lot of cases, the product is good for retaining your current members, but it's not good for attracting new members. And that should be a red flag. If it's not good enough to bring in new people and retain the people you have, you need to be rethinking. So a lot, when they move from transactional, it's hard sometimes for them to see that. Um, the other thing is culturally having that mindset around the long term, focusing on retention as opposed to acquisition. A lot of companies that have a subscription model um, are still really focused on Number of new subscribers yeah. as the most important thing. And you know what? If they're leaving after three months, you're wasting money in your marketing because you have a sieve, not a funnel. Yeah. And, you know, like this friend of mine said to me, she said, you know, they're throwing turnips onto the truck and they're falling off the back of the truck. <laughs> right? So, you know, until you close the back of the truck, there is yeah. no point in putting more turnips on. And so I think that's the second mistake is not figuring out retention. Mm. Um and um, and I think, you know, trying to be all things to all people. Um, and that's not a problem that's limited to membership, but it's a bigger issue with membership because in membership, you're relying on retaining the people for a long time. So not, if you attract the wrong people, even if they buy from you, mm. they're going to leave. So it's a waste of money. And if you have a community and you have the wrong people in the community, then the right people are going to be like, what are people talking about here? These aren't my people. Yeah, yeah, they can be poisonous to a community. Right, because yeah. I think in, in the membership economy, your members are part of your product. Yeah, yeah. They're part of your value. So if you're bringing in the wrong people, you're actually providing the wrong value. Mm. So your model just is a mess. So those those would be the the things that I think are the, the biggest issues that, I, that I've seen for, for moving from a transactional model. Um, the, the, I guess the last one is kind of a, a very short-term focus as opposed to a long-term focus. Um, when you move to subscription, you know, like people say this all the time, like I can sell this this video for for forty nine dollars, but my subscription is twenty dollars a month. So people could watch that video that was forty nine dollars in the first month and then cancel, right? Well, yeah. yeah, they could. If you don't have a good offering, that's exactly what they're going to do. But if they love the content you provide, they're going to stay because they're going to want access to that. Um, and also, the fact in a lot of cases, the fact that you can get forty nine bucks for the video is more due to the fact that your that your customers don't have good information, mm. so they're basically overpaying. So, like the example that that is painful to me that I think about is, um, you know, the company America Online, which was one of the early. Um, ways that you could connect with the internet, yeah, right? It was a yeah. dial-up service. And they had a lot, they had like a really nice portal when you dialed in so you could find things and here's where how you do email and here's how you get the weather and here's how you, you know, whatever else they offered in those early days. Mm. And it was like 19 or $20 or I don't remember, it was maybe even more, $39. And what happened is um, all of these um, DSL companies came that had much, much wider, you know, much more bandwidth and they were cheaper. And frankly, you could find a portal like Yahoo or I don't remember in those days, there were a whole bunch of other portals um, that were just as good a starting point as the AOL starting point. Yeah. So, you know, basically what was happening is the only new people who were subscribing to AOL were very unsophisticated people who didn't know that they were wasting money. Yeah. Nobody who knew anything about the business would have recommended the AOL 
over, you know, Comcast or whatever. And the reason that, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I'm, I'm kind of chuckling away here in the background trying to, to cover my mouth because I, you know, I laughed when I, I went back over that bit in the book as well, where you mentioned AOL because that's, that was my mum. Yeah. You're basically describing my mum. We, yeah. she was still on AOL. I think, she, I think she might have went down with the ship oh. with AOL, to be honest, because she, uh, I, I suppose, you know, there's a running joke in, in the web industry of people who think that Internet Explorer is the internet. They think that little blue icon is the internet. My mum thought AOL was the internet. Right. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and it's crazy. Yeah. And you're up, like what I would have advised AOL had they asked me is, you know, for people like your like first of all, they should have just dropped the price right away and said, mm. "Hey, we're so grateful, um, Mrs. Morrison, for your for your loyalty. You know, technology is advancing to such a point where we can offer it for half the price, and we're delighted to automatically cut your price in half, and you get the same value." Yeah. Um, but they didn't do that. They're like, "Oh, we're so lucky that Mrs. Morrison trusts us so much. Let's keep taking advantage of her um, for as long as we can." And that's a big thing because from a product perspective and what they were doing, you know, they were satisfying a need to provide that idiot proof portal. You know, their, their integration of email, of mm -hmm. chat, of instant messaging, you know, that was. It was it great. Was, it was still a good product when things started to go south. But as, as I suppose the moral of the story, in terms of where their focus was, was taking for granted the fact that people hadn't wised up to right. uh, the notion that outside of their walled garden, the internet was evolving to a point where actually, you know, there was a whole wide world out there that they were basically well, keeping their, their customers from. All right, and here's the test. And this is what I always ask my clients. And this is what I would have asked AOL. If your mother was on AOL, would you tell her that that was a good choice? You're the most sophisticated person. You, you do the competitive analysis. You know what's out there. Would you tell your mom to stay with AOL? Yeah. And if the answer is I wouldn't recommend my own product to the target audience that we're serving, if, if I were taking care of them, then you should not be selling. That's unethical. Yeah. Just flat out unethical. If you say, wow, there's a better deal and I can't believe these people are so naive that they continue to trust us. I mean, you don't. You know, you can say that, you know, I don't mean to pick on your, your, your mom, but, oh, you pick, know. Oh, pick away, yeah, she's. You, know, uh... <laughs> you can say, oh, you know, she's foolish, and you can also say she's loyal, and she's putting her trust in you, and she expects you to treat her well. Yeah. And fairly, and she shouldn't have to be, this is the thing about membership, is that your members should not have to be experts on what the competition is doing, because they should feel that as long as, as they stick with you, you will continue to provide them with value that justifies the cost. And AOL was not providing your mom with value that, that justified the cost anymore because they were, you know, their costs had declined and they were still charging the same amount. And the competitive alternatives had improved to such a point where it would have been really easy for your mom to use those two. And the yeah. only thing they were relying on was the fact that your mom trusted them and they were taking yeah. advantage. And that's, that's, what I think is a big mistake of a lot of membership organizations is they take advantage of the trust and don't continue to work really hard on their end of the bargain. Definitely. And I think, you know, it's if, if you're looking at things from a perspective of, can we get away with this or how long can we get away with this? Then you're coming at things from completely the wrong angle. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, absolutely. And you know, I know you're teaching your your entrepreneurs that the important thing is to keep providing lots and lots of value, mm. right? I mean, that's what you want to do. Provide lots and lots of value that's so great that the cost is irrelevant, right? Like when I go, you know, when I have major surgery needed, you know, I don't look for the best deal in surgeons, yeah. <laughs> right? I look for the one who's going to provide me so much value, i.e. extending my life and improving yeah. my quality of life that the price is irrelevant. Um, and it's the same, like if you ask me, how much do you pay for your Wall Street Journal subscription? I'm like, I don't know. Do I read it every day? No. But do I love having it around? And do I yeah. feel like I'm getting value? Yeah, absolutely. Do I think that they're out there looking for the best news and trying to provide a lens to help me absorb that information and understand my world? Absolutely. And, and that's what you want. That's the thing. You don't want a half-price parachute, do you? <laughs> right. 
Right, exactly. You don't want a half price parachute. And the other piece of that is that you don't have to be getting the most value of anybody. So a lot, another mistake that a lot of membership organizations make is they kind of revert to what I call like a Chinese menu model yeah. where you have to, you as the customer have to pick and choose your way through a whole bunch of complicated offerings and figure out what's the value for you. And instead, the organization should be saying, here, we're going to put it together in a way that makes, we know what kind of person you are and what your needs are going to be because we understand our audience and you might not use all of it, but even if you only use part of it, the value that you get is greater than the cost you're paying. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, for from our own membership site, that's something that we kind of have to be uh, quite thoughtful about because some people will join our membership site and they are literally at square one. They've got a passion for something they've got a, a certain level of, level of expertise and they want to find a way to leverage that uh, and provide a product that you know is going to deliver value and then at the other end you've got people who've been running successful membership sites for years and they are part of our site just to kind of learn to take the next level so those guys at the experience end they don't want to see content that is geared towards the people at the beginning and vice versa. So, you know, I think one of the, the great things, and, and this is coming back to what you're saying about what technology now enables us to do, is having those members needing to be within your, your ecosystem mm -hmm. in order to consume your product, the access in terms of data and behavior monitoring and so on that that gives, that then empowers you to, you know, implement your own kind of Netflix light, probably not for most people a recommendation engine, but at least to kind of pick up on the signals of, okay, well, this person's clearly at this stage. So right. let's not show them this really complicated stuff that's going to totally blow their mind. And also not let's not pile on 50 or 60 different course options and expect them to figure out which one's going to be more suited to them. Exactly. And there's there's two problems that I that I see happening. One of them is like the everything in the kitchen sink problem, which is just because five years ago you made a video does not mean you need to include it in your bundle. Yeah. Right. It might be lousy. It might be irrelevant. It might, it might be out of date. It might be less elegant than what you've since created. But a lot of people are like, but, but we already have it. So why don't we, we just offer it. We're not going to charge them more, but yeah. you want all of the offering to be awesome. So like, even if you have something, if it's not really relevant for them, or it's not really well done, there's just don't like make it lean if you have to, as long as everything is really, really good. Definitely. So, I, I mean, one of the things that um, you, you highlighted as, as a mistake that people make, which definitely rung true with us, because we've heard this so many times in people, uh, that short term mentality of, well, I don't want to switch from membership because somebody could come in, take everything within the first month and then cancel. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I think if somebody can extract all the value that's possible to extract from what you're offering within the first month, you've got more problems than than yeah. them. Oh. Yeah, you've you've got bigger problems to solve. I think. Right. Well, either either. I mean, in that case, there's there's a couple of things. One of them is um, that that you don't have enough content to be relevant for the long term. Right. Mm. If, if, you know, you can, you can get all the value in, in one month. The other thing is you might see that you have an opportunity. Like if you say there are people that come in, dig in aggressively, spend 10 hours a day on the site, get everything out of it and leave. You say, oh, wow, there is room for an intensive course here. Yeah. yeah. And I'm going to make that elegant. I'm going to package it for them. Maybe I'm going to provide them access to me for that month. And I'm going to charge triple because those people are trying, they're, they're not doing it because they're trying to save money. They're doing it because they're saying, okay, I'm about to launch my membership site. So for the next 30 days, I'm going to get up at seven in the morning. I'm going to study like mad. And then I'm going to, you know, do as much as I can because next month I'm, I'm launching. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, so sometimes if you see that behavior, that's an indicator that you have a segment that is, you know, kind of cobbling together their own solution that you don't provide yet. It's binge watching as well. It's right, you exactly know, it's comparing it to Netflix. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, notice how people are consuming your offering and say, okay, what's really going on here? Yeah. Are they are they binge watching because the price is too much? 
Are they binge watching because um, they love it so much? You know, what can I, what is it that's going on here and how can I um, support it and be compensated for the value I'm providing? You know, the other thing with the, with the binge watching that I've seen is, you know, or not binge watching, but when somebody just uses your product for a month, yeah, you know, like a lot of companies have a model, lots and lots of companies where a, the first month is really expensive and the second month is free. Mm. Right. Or, or something like that. Like, um, they'll have like sign up fees and stuff like that on top of yeah, your monthly. Yeah. It can, it can be a setup. It can be like pay cycle, which is, um, now part of Intuit. It's a, um, accounting software, mm. uh, payroll software, sorry, payroll yeah. software for small businesses. Their model for many years was pay for the first month, second and third month are free because what they wanted to do was develop the habit. Yeah. Yeah. But, but because the setup was a lot in that first month, they knew that the thing that was keeping people from, from trying it out wasn't the cost, it was the setup. So right. they're saying, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna give it away for free. We're gonna make people pay because those are the people that are willing to do the setup. But if they go ahead and do the setup and use our product, we're gonna thank them by giving them two free months. And by the fourth month, this is their habit. And yeah. then they're just gonna pay. So, or, or like um, Hightail, which is you know, the company that helps you um, share really huge files like video mm. um, their model is you know the price for one one file or one month is high, as high as the, the price for one file is the same as the price for one month right because they want to tell you that like look we understand that there are some people that really only need our product for a short time yeah but we want to reward and optimize our pricing for people that are committed for the long term amusement parks do that also so like um our local you know great america which is our our theme park here you know i think it's um it's 50 dollars to come for one day yeah um and it's 69 dollars to have a season pass. I think Universal do the same thing. It's pretty yeah, similar. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Disney, Disney does it. I mean, that's the model because what they're saying is for those people that just want to use it once, you get no discount. Yeah. But for people who are committed for the long term, we're going to make the pricing really attractive. So you can do that too. If you say we have a lot of people that come in and just use us once or for one month or whatever, say, you know, first month is $100. A year's subscription is $150. Yeah, definitely. And that, yeah, I mean, that sort of price anchoring um, and, uh, yeah, it's about value. It's, it's just demonstrating that value and showing people that you're in it for, for the long haul. You want them to be a part of your membership on a longer-term basis, and they're going to get more out of it. Yeah, absolutely. You want to optimize your pricing for the people um, that are using your offering in the way that it was intended. Absolutely. So the other big thing that you picked up on, which where we are raving advocates uh, of, is retention being as important, if not more so. And I always say as important, if not more so. I, I actually think it is far more important than acquisition uh, member retention, but particularly in in the sort of market that we're in, where you have a lot of people uh, who are doing internet marketing product launches and it's all about the big headline uh, launch and it's all six-figure launch this and seven-figure launch that. I think that has led within our audience to too much of a focus on acquisition, too much focus on bringing in people through the front door and and not locking the back door, not so much locking it, but not yes. taking care of what happens when they get in. Uh, what, right. would, what are your top tips for improving member retention and, and why do you feel uh, like we do that is so crucial and so key mm -hmm. to a yeah. successful membership site? Okay, so the first secret to retention is make sure that your product retains. So the question I always ask is, if you have the perfect customer that's exactly your target audience and they completely understand everything that you have to offer, are they going to stay for a long time? Right. And if the answer is no, then fix your product. Yeah. And then if the answer is yes then you work backwards and you say, okay, so I have the perfect product. I know with confidence that if a person looks like this and they join and they understand the value, they're going to stay. So now I have to make sure that when they join, they understand the value. So that has to do with your onboarding process. So you're kind of working your way backwards, mm. right? So you start by spending time on the, 
the kind of product market fit. Then you take a step backwards and you say, okay, how do I onboard them so that they understand all the value they can get? Because sometimes you have like a, a member who doesn't even realize all the value that's available to them. And yeah. as a result, they cancel without, they go, oh, if I'd known that I could get that, I, I would have stayed. I just didn't realize. And then you go backwards and you say, okay, so now I know that once they join, they're going to see what's available to them and they're going to stay. So then you say, okay, how do I attract more of those people? And that's when you start to work on the, you know, the awareness and trial. Um, but you want to start at the, at the back end of the funnel. The other thing that you want to do is make sure that you're not confusing inertia with loyalty. So I have clients all the time that say, oh yeah, our clients are so loyal. They've been around for 30 years. These are like professional societies and things. And I'm like, are they loyal? Or have they just forgotten that they give you a hundred bucks every year? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and inertia, especially in your world, in the kind of online world, it's really easy to see if people aren't coming to your site. And what you need to do is if somebody isn't exhibiting the behaviors that will demonstrate that they're getting value, you need to intervene. Yeah. So the, one example is it's a gym, like a like a health club. Um, and I have a friend who told me this story about how he had a family membership at this very posh gym near near our house. Um, his office was in the same complex as the the gym, and his family, you know, he lived less than a mile away, so he had this family membership. Yep. And then what happened was his family moved, so his wife and kids stopped going, and he still went. Because he, his office was still right there. Yeah. Um, and he said, you know, gosh, they could have told, because you have to check in with, a, with like an electronic card every time you go, and they check how many people. And he said, they should have noticed that my wife wasn't checking in. She used to check in three or four times a week, and now she was checking in zero times a week. Right. They should have called. And it doesn't have to be high tech. They could have just picked up the phone and said, hey, we noticed that you're still coming, but your wife's not coming. What's up? So they didn't call. And then a few months went by. And... Then what ended up happening, his wife found another club, and he started going to that club with her on, on weekends and on Fridays, and he stopped going to the club. So you could see this slow path toward yeah. everybody leaving the club. And then at the end of six months, he canceled, right. right? And they called him, and they said, how do we keep you? And he's like, it's too late. <laughs> what they should have done is the minute that his wife stopped coming that they noticed, they should have called and said, what's going on? Yeah. And he would say that. And they'd say, okay, great. Why don't we downgrade you to a solo membership? You can save $100 a month. He might have stayed. Absolutely. Right? But he was, paying, he was paying $250 a month for his family membership. And if they'd done that, they and, would have scored quite, quite high in terms of goodwill as well. Because you don't, I absolutely. think, you don't expect companies to, to say, we notice you're not using us as much. So let's bump you down a level. Exactly. So, you know, so that's, and, and if you bring that to like the online model, you can see if people are visiting, you know, gosh, if someone's visiting once a week and then you don't see them, hmm. you know, even, you know, you don't even have to be electronic about it. You can pull a spread, you know, you can pull your data out and put it in a spreadsheet and just run your finger down the list and say, okay, <laughs> these people, their numbers have declined month over month. I'm going to pick up my phone, that, that old fashioned tool, and I'm going to call them. Or you can be cool and technology savvy and have it automated and electronic. But the, the point is you want to, you want to talk to them before they cancel. Yeah. Like so much effort is focused on like what to do when someone calls to cancel or when they hit the cancel button. There's this whole strategy of retention by hiding the cancel button. Yes. Yes. Which is again, unethical. Yeah, that uh, it's yeah, that's a particular bugbear for me, and it's quite uh, it's quite timely actually because as I mentioned before, obviously through what we do, Callie and I are both uh, individually members of several of the membership sites. Uh, some of it to obviously progress our own learning, but also so we've got our finger on the pulse of what other people are doing. And uh, one website Callie actually tried to cancel today uh, simply mm -hmm. because. It, it wasn't really doing anything in terms of content. The community was pretty much non-existent. I think the the quote unquote thought leader behind it had pretty much checked out. Uh, that moved on to something else, and there was no cancel button. There was no option to cancel. There wasn't even a if you want to cancel, email this address. So it just so happened that she she had had a direct email from the community manager several months before. 
So she mm-hmm. contacted them and said, "Listen, I'm I'm looking to cancel. Like, can you can you let me know? I can't seem to find the option." And it took three or four emails back and forth, which uh, basically went along the lines of, "Well, why why would you possibly want? They couldn't wrap their head around why someone might want to leave, and obviously they don't realise what we do." So right. they they threw out some uh, some rubbish about well you know because of our our system it may it'll take two to three weeks to process a cancellation during that time your next payment will go out so you may as well stick around and it was it was that sort of uh, I'll not swear because uh, we need to maintain yeah, the, it's a the family cl- show yes it's a family show <laughs> but it was that it was that BS basically and and we had to go back and say listen. We do this for a living. We do this for clients. We do this for members of our site. These are the systems you're using. We know for certain that you can cancel it in an instant. And actually, our next payment won't go out because we can also cancel the subscription in PayPal. But the point being with that is, I think, coming into what you're saying, it's it's when it comes to cancellations, firstly, accepting that they're going to happen. And it's not always personal. You know, it's uh, Callie has nothing against the person buying the community, and she may well have rejoined in the future, but she won't now because they made the process of cancelling difficult rather than focusing on making the decision to cancel difficult. Sorry, I got a bit of a rant there. This has literally just happened. It happened this afternoon, so I put in my little notes. Yes, today's cancellation was. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's, I mean, so many organizations, especially in the D2C world, like the direct-to-consumer world of, mm. um, like you talked about continuity programs, like uh, organizations, like, you know, where you where you buy on TV, you know, and they, like, they, whatever, the, the beauty care products or, um, you know, it used to be with the, um, the, the music clubs where you'd get um, a selection every month. Those organizations are built around that model. Yeah. Um, gyms are built. I mean, most gyms are built on that model of like people join and they forget they join and it's hard to cancel. So we get like I've heard people say, oh, and we get an extra two or three months out of them because they can't figure out how to cancel. Right. You go and like if Callie hadn't been so motivated. Right. Probably another month might have gone by and they would have gotten one more payment. Absolutely. Uh, and- uh, one of the main um gym chains in the uk there's actually government uh, investigations and what have you going into uh, investigating gym contracts here in the uk because one of the major chains they make you give three months notice in order oh. to cancel your membership and you can only cancel in writing mm. and if they say that they didn't receive your letter then they, right, they they don't have to cancel. Yeah, so they always say they didn't receive the letter. So it's it's such a crazy way. I think particularly today, where the potential for somebody to you know, and they say if somebody gives you bad service, it used to be they'll tell they'll tell ten people. You know, if someone has a bad experience, they'll tell ten people. Yeah, yeah. These days with social media, it's more likely to be ten thousand people. So why yeah. somebody would try would still kind of stick to those. Uh, outdated uh, strategies is is just crazy no we're 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 the choir in the church right now yes absolutely (laughs) uh so just shifting gears a bit um into talking about the membership economy and the fact that that's where business is going now essentially i think every every business uh that is is kind of standing out as as being successful seems to have some sort of membership or some sort of community element to it uh, what would you say, just kind of in a nutshell, are the keys for businesses to survive and thrive in in this new membership economy? I think that the, the number one key is uh, focus on a community that you can serve really well and that has a clearly defined mission hmm. and keep following their evolving needs. Um, that's probably, you know, don't get wrapped up, like you said, don't get wrapped up in complicated technologies, you know. Keep it simple, um, test and adjust, uh, be willing to evolve um, your offering. So I, I'm listening right now to um, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Eat, Pray Love. Right. And she talks about the problem of calling your creative um, output your babies. You know how people will say, oh, you know, this book is my baby or this this video is my baby. I've worked so hard on it. Well, if yeah. you call it your baby, I mean, just think about that. Then what's the metaphor of selling your baby, cutting <laughs> off 30, cutting down 30% of your baby, um, 
killing your baby to make room for new babies. You know, it's a terrible metaphor. You know, you really want to think about it as you have limitless creative potential to come up with new things to help your members. And as those things, you know, as they become less relevant or stale, you know, introduce new stuff. Yeah. Don't 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 feel bad to say, you know, this wonderful creation that I did five years ago has run its course and I am going to allow it to retire. Uh, yeah, I think the, the whole, uh, you, you see a lot of people who are far too willing, I think, to go down with the ship when it comes to their product. Mm-hmm. And, you know, certainly modern history in terms of businesses and online ventures, it's littered with examples of companies who failed because they just didn't adapt they didn't evolve and they were so rigidly stuck to their old models yeah it's like the um you know i think about public libraries Um, Mm. you know the mission of a public library is to provide the world with access to the world's information at a low cost or or even for free yeah and you know google has the same mission yeah and the libraries are so in love with their books and their buildings um, that they kind of missed the whole search engine revolution, mm. right? They could have partnered with Google when Google launched, what, in, when did Google launch it? Like two, th- 1998, yeah, something like, like that, or, it? 99. They could have said, oh, this cool technology that these grad students are, are, are launching, we should, we should offer that in our libraries or we should work with them. You know, like for many years, Google's been um, cataloging all of the books in the world so that you will actually be able to search the world's books, not just research stuff, but actually, you know, every novel, yeah. every short story, um, you know, libraries were just too in love with their own products. Yeah, definitely. So what what membership businesses out there are exciting you right now? Obviously, there's Netflix, which I'm guessing you're you're always going to have a, a huge yeah. soft spot for Netflix. And yeah, I mean, I live by Netflix. When we're, it's funny talking about ownership versus access. Um, I was an avid collector of DVDs in the early 2000s, and I've uh-huh. still got despite countless um, car boot sales to kind of offload a whole bunch of ones I don't watch anymore, we've still got bookcases and bookcases full of DVDs. But I was watching um, Californication, David Duchovny. Mm-hmm. Uh, we mm-hmm. started watching that again. And we've got the DVD box set, but we're watching it on Netflix. And we've done that several times where it's actually, it's, it's funny, even if you do own the, uh, the, the, the yeah. TV show or the film, Still putting it on Netflix because it's convenient and because I've got one of the little yeah, Amazon Fire easier. Sticks. It is. It is. Anyway, sorry, that was a little bit of a segue. Uh, what, mm-hmm. uh, what other membership businesses out there are, are doing stuff that's exciting you as someone who's obviously heavily invested in analyzing and looking at the, the strategies that are going on within the membership economy? Well, um, so, so on the digital native side, um, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn mm. uh, because, you know, they – they have the mission of helping people with their careers, and they have evolved so much as they continue to extend the range of services that they can offer to their members. Yeah. Um, both, and they use, you know, they use, they have a free offering, they have a premium offering, so they use freemium model. Uh, they just bought lynda.com, you know, the, um, the educational big, big video one. community, yeah. big deal, really savvy, really thoughtful. Um, so I love them. Um, on the, uh, on the physical side, I'm very interested in what you were calling that, um, uh, continuity program, direct to consumer physical products. Mm. Um, there's all kinds of subscription boxes and replenishment services that are really starting to embrace the principles of the membership economy. So they're really building community around that. They're really getting to know, um, people's needs and evolving their offerings. And this can be, instead of being, um, you know, uh, virtual offerings like, like, uh, video content or music or news, yeah. it's becoming like, you know, what beauty products you need and evolving those offerings over the seasons or, con- or surprising and delighting people. Um, Amazon prime, um, in my community is now offering, uh, oh gosh, prime now, which is, we, um, we just got that. Yeah, we are, we are hour, one of right? <laughs> yeah, we are one of three. I think there's three cities in the UK where it's been trialed, and it is unbelievable. Yeah. It, it's crazy. Yeah. I still, it still baffles me that. Um, How can they do it? Yeah, 
yeah, it's, it's awesome. It's nuts. And funny enough, I've got actually Amazon Prime. It was a case of you don't mention it, I'm going to. I, I'm such a huge fan of what those guys are doing. I think they encapsulate a lot mm-hmm. of what you talk about uh, in terms of principles of the membership economy, especially when you think when we joined uh, Amazon Prime, when it was literally just a delivery option. Yeah. And and now there's what video there's well it's um, their Trojan it's their Trojan horse it is it, it is it's it's, for, it's their source of testing and trial as well as this you know value valuable service so people pay for the delivery mm. but then they get exposed to all the other stuff which changes behavior right they're moving us from um, you know Netflix or uh, Pandora or Spotify yeah. to Amazon or, or Apple. For music, because now you're like, oh, well, I'm Prime, and now I get music for free, or it's included. So I'm going to start experimenting with that. So it's amazing what they've, you know, they they keep evolving Prime mm. to continue to extend their um, influence over how we spend our money. It's they're, it, they're going to get our whole wallet eventually. Yeah, yeah, and you know what? I'm actually quite happy about that. They do. I'm sure there's people out there, particularly in the UK, they get a slightly bad rap now because they don't pay tax in the UK, um, which mm-hmm. means that they get demonised. Basically, any US corporation that doesn't pay tax in the UK is is kind of demonised and held up as the reason for every problem that uh, there may be with the economy. Mm-hmm. But anyhow, I, I love Amazon. Whether they're, they're evil or whether they have nothing but good intentions, they do a very good job of making me feel feel good about being mm-hmm. a part of being a member being a prime member yeah and, absolutely and what's nuts when you mention the replenishment services uh we don't have them here yet but one of our uh it's actually one of our, our partners one of the products that we promote uh, in terms of membership plugins they very kindly uh sent a amazon gift card to both Callie and, and to myself. And it was in dollars. It was in US dollars. And Amazon have this strange thing where you can't redeem dollar uh, gift certificates on the UK uh, store. So we had to redeem it on the US store. Now, obviously, because we're coming to the US over Christmas, I was having a little look at what's available on Prime now for one hour delivery in Manhattan. And oh, interesting. So obviously, I, I don't look at the US Amazon side very often. I don't have calls to. But I was just blown away when I saw they now have those, um, I can't remember what they call them, but they're the, just the little buttons that you stick on your washing machine or in your bathroom so that when you run out of washing powder, you press the button and it automatically orders it for the next day through Amazon. Oh, so those yeah. Rep- oh, so cool. That is just insane. I mean, that is crazy. Okay, we're, we're out of mouthwash. I'll just press this button and somebody will bring me some tomorrow. I and mean, that's that's mental. Or or today in an hour. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy. I suppose on that note, what, what do you think the future holds for the membership model? How do you think it's going to change and evolve over the next few years? Well, so a couple of things. One is I think that membership is going to, you know, become much more prevalent around physical products, like we like we've just been discussing, both in terms of replenishment, um, with with button pushing or with just automated, you know, it comes every month. Yeah. Um, but but in integrating the whole supply chain, which is really complicated, into that experience, um, and and then the other thing is those big categories, you know, where we're spending our money. Those are increasingly going to see. Um, disruptive forces so that you know where do we spend our money we spend our money on um on uh, shelter we spend it you know in terms of our home and our vacation you know places where we stay on vacation we see it in terms of our health care um, we see it in terms of the food we eat um all of those areas are going to be ripe for um for new membership models and you know yeah you can see that kind of starting to shift that way with the proliferation of things like Airbnb and and stuff like that. I mean, I hadn't even heard of it 18 months ago, but now right, I've exactly. actually I've got several friends who've used them and we've actually looked on them for our own trips as well. So um yeah, it's certainly going to be exciting and interesting for anybody who uh, has an interest in observing what's going on with the membership model and it's all material for uh, a follow-up as well possibly to the membership economy. Yeah, yeah, I'm just starting to think about that. <laughs> <Sort of daunting, laughs> but Awesome. 
That's great. So, um, Robbie, thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time. I know I've kind of kept you a bit longer than we expected. Uh, for anyone who obviously wants to learn more about yourself and to get more of your insight, input and experience into the membership economy, membership businesses, let us know where our listeners can find out about you, how they can connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing I would say is get the book, uh, The Membership Economy. And um, uh, website is, uh, there's the book site, which is membershipeconomy.com. And uh, my consulting firm site is peninsulastrategies.com. So, you know, I'm a consultant by training and by experience. So Mm -hmm. for those listeners who are really committed to building something big, um, you know, that, you know, the consulting and advisory is, is definitely the way to, 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 uh, turbocharge your efforts. And, um, you know, all my contact information is available on the site. You can call me, you can email me. Um, and if you're, if your listeners have questions and they send them to you and you send them to me, I'm happy to, to answer those and, um, either put them back in your, in your community or, or in the form of a blog, whatever is most useful for you and for your, for your community. Yeah. Robbie Bax. Uh, is my uh, Twitter handle. Cool. Uh, there's the membership economy on Facebook. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, I'm not hard to find. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Robbie, it's been an absolute pleasure. Lots of, lots of really good stuff there. Lots of uh, value bombs. Sorry, I'm taking that phrase. I never use that word, but I, <laughs> I know Chris, I think Chris Ducker started it yeah. with, with his interview. And then I was listening to Amy Schmidt, our, who threw it out there yeah, and yeah. name dropped Chris. So I'm just kind of keeping the value bomb chain going here. So uh, right. basically every podcast interview you do, every other interview, someone will drop a a, a use of the word value bomb. Oh, that's <laughs> so nice. <laughs> yeah. So well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so, so much for uh, being on the podcast. And uh, I look forward to the follow-up to the membership economy. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Robbie for taking the time to join me on the Membership Guys podcast. I really enjoyed that conversation and I feel that there was so much great insight, advice and tips shared that can help anybody at any stage of running a membership site. I really hope you guys enjoyed uh, my conversation with Robbie as much as I did and hopefully we'll be able to get her back on the show sometime in the future to share even more value bombs That one's for you, Chris Ducker, uh, from the world of membership site. Thanks again for downloading the Membership Guys podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and I'll be back very soon with another episode. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the Membership Guys podcast, we invite you to check out the membersiteacademy.com. The Member Site Academy is the essential resource for anyone at any stage of starting, growing and running a membership website. So whether you're still figuring out what your idea is going to be or whether your website is already up and running and you're just looking for ways to grow it and attract new members, then the Member Site Academy can help you to get to the next level. With our extensive course library, monthly training, exclusive member-only discounts, perks and tools, and a supportive community to help you along the way with feedback, encouragement and advice, the Member Site Academy is the perfect place to be for anyone looking to start, manage and grow a successful membership website. So check it out at membersiteacademy.com.